magnitude. There are numbers. It does have equal intervals, but it's lacking the absolute zero. And we, we call those kind of scales interval scales because all they really have is equal intervals. They don't have anything else. And finally, the ratio scale has all the good properties the scale should have. Magnitude, equal intervals, absolute zero. And examples of that would be everything. Height, weight, income, number, income number of children, um, uh, now, so the question is, and this is what this is really leads this is the question we're up to in the homework. So why is it called a ratio scale? I told you why it's called a nominal scale because of the word nominal, name. I told you why it's called an ordinal scale because of the word order. I told you why it's called an interval scale because of the word equal intervals. So why is it called a ratio scale? And the answer again was on the board, I think, twice already. And Kelvin said that it's because it forms ratios. And that's sort of right, but it leaves you out one word. I think. I really know you can argue with that. In fact, this is the right answer. Anything else that was? I think somebody wrote something else. Did somebody else write something else the other day that wasn't? Is it you, uh, Gina? That's just really missing one word, I think. Or, um, but even uh, Kelvin, to be, to be fair to you, even that might be considered might be totally right itself. I think the extra word doesn't really add too much to it. Would you write, Gina? So you're able to So that's saying more or less, but a little more, a little more elaborated, which is a little more understandable. If you want to compare, let's say, an earthquake of six to an earthquake of three, can you say the earthquake of six is twice as strong as the earthquake of three? It makes no sense. Three is hard; you can hardly feel, and six is the whole city's falling down. So it's not twice as strong; it's a thousand times stronger. Um, if you, something is two degrees outside, can you say this, compare it to one degree? Can you say when it's two degrees outside today and it's one degree yesterday, today is twice, twice as hot as yesterday? Does that make any sense? Makes no sense, right? But if something is, if a piece of lumber is six feet long and another piece of lumber is three feet long, can you say the six foot lumber is twice as big as the three foot lumber? That makes perfect sense. And why, why, so in other words, in certain kind of situations, you're allowed to form the ratios. In other kind of situations, you can't form the ratio. You say twice as big or three times as big or five times as big. So when, what's the difference? So whenever a scale has all these properties, the ratio says it has all these three properties, in particular has the absolute zero, which means when you start at zero, it truly means zero, then six, in fact, is twice as big as three. So again, so in summary, why is, it, why is a ratio scale called by that particular name? Because the numbers that come out of a ratio scale can be compared by forming ratios. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the answer to the question, which you, know, you guys who haven't had me last term don't realize how much how lucky you are, because we could spend hours fighting about this. So what was actually work? No, I, uh, of course it can form ratios, but I'm saying, but no, no, but even, but even yeah. Kelvin, Kelvin, because the fact you, 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 you can form ratios or form ratios, I mean, we can argue about it as it is, but if you put the word can form ratios, it's a little bit clearer. Check your notes when they say. I don't have any notes. Okay. I said the reason why it's called a ratio scale is because scales which have which have the ratio scale has these properties. They have these properties. You're able to form ratios. You're able to immediately say something is twice as big as something else. You can't do that with the other scales. That's the whole. That's the whole thing. We now finish chapter one, and now we move on to chapter two. I think we're going to skip. Of course, I'd rather uh, I'd rather do the, the video for chapter three. We'll come back to chapter two perhaps on. On Wednesday or whenever. We're not going to do chapter two, but I'm skipping to chapter three. Now, chapter three is, to put chapter three into its perspective, we'll begin by talking about statistics. Statistics <coughs> is a branch of mathematics. Of course, there's other branches of mathematics like geometry and calculus, etc. And math itself is a branch of something else, a branch of science, perhaps. And science is a branch of something else, like knowledge, perhaps. And they can use, you can create all kinds of different categories. Um, That's it. That's it. Sorry, I don't think the camera gets that far. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, we'll record that. Did you record this? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So we have statistics. We have we have math, 
producing many subcategories, including, including statistics. And we have statistics being broken up into two major categories that we're going to discuss this term, plus a third category, which I mentioned. The first one is called descriptive statistics. Uh, and the second part of the term, which is really chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, and some subsequent chapters, is called inferential statistics. And in the middle, we'll talk about probability, but probability technically is not really a branch of statistics. It's really a branch of mathematics. Uh, but we use probability a lot, like the Bell-shaped curve, and binomial distribution, a lot of stuff in, in statistics based on probability. What's the bottom one on that? What's the other one on math? Is that one here? No, I'm saying math has many examples. Oh. Statistics, calculus, geometry, trigonometry, all that stuff is branches of math. Statistics is just one branch of math. It happens to be a practical or applied branch of math, but it's still a branch of math. Now, what is descriptive statistics? So those are those formulas, I mean, it sounds like a dictation, but you don't have to necessarily write it down word for word, but those formulas, methods, and concepts that help you summarize and describe data. Anytime you're summarizing and describing data, you're using descriptive statistics. So how, what's an example of describing data? You calculate the average of a bunch of data, you calculate the standard deviation of a bunch of data. If you're doing things like that, you're making a, a pie chart of a bunch of data. All those are examples of of descriptive statistics, you're summarizing and describing data, you're not doing any analysis, you're simply describing the facts. The more sophisticated, more complicated, but in fact use less <coughs> of that, is inferential statistics. When you try to draw inferences or conclusions from your data, when you're trying to make a decision, well, this average is compared to this average is bigger or the same or different, <coughs> you want to know, um, you know, stuff like in confidence intervals will be an example of inferential statistics. Hypothesis testing will be an example of stuff that's, that's categorized as inferential statistics. So when you're drawing inferences or conclusions from your data, you're dealing with inferential statistics. So we're going to start out with um, uh, chapter two, I think, talks about how to make different graphs. Uh, pie chart, bar chart, uh, histogram, polygon, OGI. We'll probably talk about that at some point. But right now I'd like to talk about chapter three, which talks about two ways of summarizing data, two, two numerical ways of summarizing data. The first one is close down, this is chapter, we can do this by chapters, this is, this is chapter, this is chapter two, chapter three, this is chapter two, where they make different kinds of graphs. In chapter three, we're gonna learn about two major categories. The first category is called measures <coughs> of, is it, does Brian, is it record higher? Measures of, Central tendency. And the second half of the chapter is called measures of dispersion. All right, now, what's measures of central tendency? Well, that's basically those formulas that help you measure the center of a bunch of data. Of course, the most common one is the average. When you're calculating the average, you're calculating the middle of a bunch of data, which, of course, is a great way of describing and summarizing all the data. But it turns out there are a couple of ways of measuring central tendency. The mean is one way. That's the average. We call it the average. The median is another way, which is a drop less familiar, but still pretty familiar. And there are other ways as well, like the mode and things like that. And again, uh, if we don't cover it in class and it happens by accident, this shows up in the homework, we don't have to worry about it. Just, just have to worry about the mean and the median right now. Uh, Uh, I guess I should erase this. So, what's the mean? Well, of course, the mean is the mean is symbolized. Again, it's important to understand this subtle distinction. A lot of people continue to get it confused throughout the whole term, and it does hurt them in the long run. Yes, the mean of the population, which is symbolized by that Greek letter mu that I just erased, mu, 
then there's the mean of the sample. But we're going to be spending the most of the time talking about the mean of the sample. That's why the place is called statistic.